I can tell you something I like about it is that、uh, you don't have to make any decisions, and because everything decision was made for you, so make your life simpler. Very simple. You just do what you are told to do. <laughs> Absolutely, that was when people ask me what was the first culture shock for me, and I said choices. Oh my goodness, I have so many choices. Um, just just about everything I do, I have choices. And in the beginning, it was really overwhelming. Shi Van Fleet, thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank you for inviting me. Yeah, so you you rose to prominence because of、uh, a speech you gave, a one minute speech in Loudoun County,、uh, Virginia, and after that, you、uh, you ended up writing your book,、uh, Miles America. Is there anything? And you've been all over the news. You've been on Fox News. You've been on a ton of podcasts. So you're pretty well known, very well known. But is there anything you'd like listeners who maybe aren't familiar with you to know about you? Well, I, I just think that, uh,、um, uh, and I want people to see that、uh, I'm really, really、um, now an activist, but I'm really, really was a nobody, very quiet, typical. Asian immigrant, and I did not participate in 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 anything political before uh 2020, and、uh, so I just want people to know. And I was doing this not because you know one day I woke up that、uh, I just decided I want to be an activist. I was compelled to do it because this to me is.、Um, Is a really a matter of、uh, whether our republic survive or not, and so for that reason, I I spoke up, and、uh, and people call me courageous, and I don't think so. Why? Because I'm fighting for myself. I lived under communism once, and I don't want to live it under communism again. And nobody does, but they so many people don't understand it. So I'm fighting for myself. So I just want people to know that it's when you fight for yourself, you know, you don't need courage; you just need determination. Yeah. Well,、uh, I am thirty-nine years old, so I'm a millennial, and I didn't, I didn't learn about communism in school. Now, granted, I was a troublemaker if from like fifth grade to like tenth grade. I got kicked out of class a lot. And so I wasn't always there in class, but I typically knew what was being taught in class still. And there was nothing about the Soviet Union and nothing about Mao's China、uh, taught in my classes, from what I remember. And it wasn't until I was older that I started looking into these things a bit more. I've learned more about the Soviet Union, but Mao's China,、uh, the Cultural Revolution, especially, very little、oh, I did、know. I learn about that.、Uh, a few years. Back, I read、um, *The Laws of Human Nature* by Robert Greene, and he tells a story about two college students at Beijing University, and how the Cultural Rev- Revolution unraveled for them. And that was really interesting. But it just seems like something that is not discussed much. And、no. you give some history of it in your book, but your book is a little bit more c- comparing what's going、Parallels. on in America now.、Yes. Um, so it's not like a history book, no, it's not. But could you maybe give a little bit of information、uh, for listeners what the Cultural Revolution is? Because sadly, I think a lot of people probably don't know. Yeah, and no, you're absolutely right. Because、uh, when I was uh, giving that、um, uh, you called speech, basically it's a comment. It's a comment uh, that uh, you know、uh, we can sign up, and it's less than a minute. So, and when I Give that little comment, and、uh, I did not think much about it, even though that was my first time、uh, participating in a, in an、uh, event like that. And then second day, I got a、um, call from、uh, Fox News, want to interview me for an article. And then I got other calls, calls that of people I don't know. Somehow they got my number, and they were just absolutely just、um, uh, very very grateful that I. I went and talked and I mentioned about cultural revolution. I was like, everybody knows this is cultural revolution. Now, yeah, I found out that people just absolutely 
have very little idea. In that room, when the people uh, cheer for me, I think most of them probably heard it the first time. So what is a cultural revolution? Why I even bother to write a book about it? And it's because, because history repeating. What we have here is yeah. our version of the cultural revolution. So let me explain what the cultural revolution is about because it, 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 it is complicated. It's just a history that most people know very little about. So the, uh, the Communist Party uh, of China took power in 1949. They defeated the uh, nationalists and so um, and uh, drove them to the island of Taiwan. And that's the, the, uh, the, uh, the history of uh, mm. Taiwan versus China. Okay, the Taiwan was the sitting government that the CCP overthrow, use the military um, um, forces. So it's a, like a uh, armed insurrection. So after that, Mao was determined to bring socialism to China. And he started with uh, land reform and uh, basically just one political campaign after another, basically nonstop. Um, and each one of them um, left behind millions and millions of uh, victims. So in 1958, he started this, uh, what they call, what he called Great Leap Forward campaign. He felt by then, he felt like uh, everything was under control and this is uh, time to transform China into socialism. And, mm. uh, and, and he also want to, uh, modernize China. So he had this uh, ambitious plan to use just pure manpower to transform China by producing uh, more steel than uh, UK and United States in 15 years. Yeah. You know, we have this hundreds of millions of people, you know, we can do that. So everybody was uh, required to participate in steel making, um, including kids, urban dwellers, peasants, everybody. So uh, the uh, in the so the backyard furnace were raised everywhere, and people have to give uh, give quota. You know, each district or whatever you have to produce this much, mm -hmm. and so people just uh, have to look for anything metal at home, doorknobs, kitchen utensil and walks, everything, just throw it into the furnace. Of course, it come out junk. So mm. that uh, campaign failed, failed miserably. And uh, not just that, the crop failed as well because there's no one attending the fields. The um, men and, and uh, women were all um, uh, making steel. So the old and the sick were at home. So anyway, the crop failed. After that, there was a three-year famine, killed as many as uh, 50 million people. Wow. And so that was a big deal. Even in the communist country under a dictatorship, that was a big deal. So the blame was placed on Mao because it, that was his idea. And he was forced to, um, to let someone else run the country basically to recover the economy. And so he was have to take a back seat. And mm. for him, it was not acceptable. As a dictator, you know, he has to have all the power. So from 1962 to 1966, four years, China seemed to be quiet and China seems to be on the way to recover from the disastrous famine but it's not. Mao mm. used that time to prove uh, to uh, to plan a comeback, and so he launched the Cultural Revolution in 1966. And so, what's his plan? Take power back mm. because he he feel like uh, he was no longer in control of his party and his government, and he was not all that wrong, and. Um, even though in general, the people still, people did not know really what's going on in the, in, in inside the party. They still really feel like, a, um, they really still consider him the great leader. 
So、yeah. what、uh, his plan was uh, using uh, people to overthrow his party and his government. So basically, it is a revolution, just as he called、yeah. a cultural revolution. And this time, just like the first time, is also about power. Last time he took power from the nationalists. This time he is going to take power from communists.、Yeah. Sounds really、uh, strange, but that's exactly what happened. So、yeah. last time he used his army, the Red Army.、Um, this time he really could not use the army. That some that really looked like a coup, right?、Yeah. But he had a better army. Those are the young people. Young people, tens of millions of them. Uh, from elementary school all the way to、uh, university, and、yeah. they are called the Red Guards. They were given the power to do whatever to take the power back from those in the roles of authority. That was the goal. That was the game. So they were given the power because Mao、uh, openly declared. He was、um, behind the Red Guards, and、uh, they were his Red Guards, and he was their commander in chief.、Hmm. Because of that, no one dared to stop the Red Guards. Also, he dismantled the cri、uh, criminal justice system, kind of like a defund police.、Yeah. So no one could stop. So the Red Guards did exactly what Mao wanted them to do. Started with. Teachers, professors, and school administrators. Why? When the kids think about people in authority, what they come to their mind first? Of course, teachers. Yeah. And so, so the killing and the violence started in school, and gradually it went、um, spread all over the country. And、uh, so, within、uh, two years. The Red Guards did exactly what Mao wanted them to do: took down all those in power, and、uh, so they thought, "Okay, we did,、um, we, we we did what we're told to do," and they start to fight each other for power. They thought they are going to give him a seat at the table, and of course, they were mistaken. Just like today's social justice warriors, they think one day they're going to get a seat. No, they were discarded. As soon as the job was done, Mao sent them all to gulags.、Uh, even though it's a better、uh, of a word for it, it's called re-education by the peasants. Send them all、mm -hmm. to the countryside, to remote areas, to be re-educated.、Yeah. So after that, the, the, the Cultural Revolution continued, but the movement called the Red Guards movement was over. And so, at last, the whole Cultural Revolution lasted for ten years until Mao's death in 1976. So that is the background. We can talk about the details.、Yeah. Um, so I hope that makes sense.、Yeah. So this, you can, you, you need to remember one thing, and then, then just make it just, just very easy to to understand. It is someone who want complete power,、uh, absolute power. And using young people, and, and to weaponize the young people to reach、yeah. the goal. That is a, in a, in a, in in really in a,、um, in summary. That's what the Cultural Revolution was about. But we can talk about what happened and what the, the Red Guards really did、yeah. in detail. One of、uh, this is from Robert Greene's、uh, story. Um, about the two students that there were these two students at Beijing University.、Uh, their names were Gao Jinhua and Fang Pu, and they they were basically it, it was during the Cultural Revolution, and they you know one of them started being、uh, a revolutionary, I guess, and then、uh, the other one was. A revolutionary ended up being a revolutionary, but he didn't like the tactics of the other person. He was more moderate. But then you hear the story of them just getting more and more extreme. It just gets more and more violent, and there was this、uh, atmosphere of, and Mao pushed this because Mao started the whole thing of like, 
you have to be, you're, you're constantly competing to be more revolutionary than the person next to you, right? So you, you don't want to appear to be an anti-revolutionary. Like you, you need to basically put on a show of being revolutionary and it's all in Mao's honor. And it kind of reminded me of, uh, when around 2020, when racism was being discussed a lot, I started seeing people say things like, it's not enough to be, it's not enough not to be racist. You need to be anti-racist. Yeah. And this is where that rhetoric kind of hits me like, yeah, it's, it's constantly this, you need to be more, you need to be not doing yes. enough. You're not yeah. doing enough. Yeah. So I, I'd love for you to dive into that atmosphere a little bit. Yeah, this is, uh, you know, in the revolution, a, a revolution is really, you know, the radicals, the revolutionaries carry out um, the agenda of that revolution. And uh, so there is competition, like you described. And uh, the first thing is that uh, um, you can see, and this is really alarming, and it's happening in America, that women try to out, um, out do the man because uh, Mao uh, taught us that uh, femininity is bad. Femininity means it's bourgeois-like. It is uh, anti-revolutionary and we don't want to femininity. We want masculinity, even mm -hmm. in women. So a lot of women, girls, young girls, will try to prove themselves so they, and I tweet about this just two days ago, and um, a lot of women outdo men because they want to prove themselves. And yeah. so the first killing uh, in the Cultural Revolution was done by a bunch of young girls, really young teen, teenagers. They beat and killed their principal. It did not start with men. And also about uh, the ideology, um, so it start, it's kind of complicated. I don't know whether, okay, I try my best to explain. The first group of the Red Guards were the uh, offspring, the children of the ruling class. And so they were the ones that uh, their parents, especially in Beijing, were all high CCP officials. They started, mm -hmm. and so they were going after those people that have already being denounced by the CCP. They were already labeled as rightist, as uh, landlord, rich peasants, um, whatever. So they were, they were after those people. And uh, so it's very brutal. They killed a lot of those people who were already, already being denounced and punished. And that's not really Mao's um, intention. Mao's intention was uh, to get those in power out of power. So those in power were the parents of the original Red Guards. Do you see mm. that? Yeah. Okay, because in the beginning, they did not want to um, other uh, uh, young, young people to join them because they're not good enough. They are the best because they are the offspring. They are the one uh, carried the revolutionary, the red gene. So when the table was turned that uh, the uh, the other people could join, and that's when the competition start. Hmm. Those people were the dis uh, the offspring of average Chinese, never yeah. had any power, and uh, all the people that their parents being denounced by the CCP, and they suffered from those who were in power. So when they joined the, uh, uh, the ranks of the Red Guard, they become even more uh, ruthless hmm. because this time they're really taking revenge. And so the slogan is um, silence, basically silence is, uh, is uh, violence. Everyone has to join. And yeah. uh, so, and you, you, there's a lot of photos you can even search now on the internet. And yeah. those people were ruthless going after all those in power. And I uh, participated in the struggle session 
of the governor of my province. He was struggled against for, I don't know, more than a hundred times. His wife along his side uh, was also struggled against and the red guards put all her hair out uh, off and he, she eventually committed suicide. Mm -hmm. And so his son was in college. He tried to defend his father and, and, and then he was beaten by the red guards. This time by the red guards who were the children of the ordinary people. Beat him to death. Yeah, killed him. And that, uh, and, and so that's become just absolutely a competition of who is more, who can be more ruthless, who yeah. can be more brutal. So one of the things that Mao wanted to do is he wanted to get rid of the past. He wanted to be unburdened by what has been, exactly. essentially. Uh, he wanted to get rid of the four olds. What were the four olds? Yes, the four olds in, in, uh, in, one, in one word is the past. It's the old tradition, old culture, old ideas, old habits. It yeah. is anything Chinese, anything traditional, anything old, and it has to be all destroyed, all of them, even habits. And they destroyed, of course, they went after the uh, statues because that's the most obvious thing, right? They yeah. just destroy. And then they change street names, institutional names, and, uh, and then they canceled the Chinese New Year because that's old. They canceled everything that is absolutely um, of uh, Chinese civilization. Yeah. Why? That, that's a good question. Why Kamala say the same thing? You know, imagine what can be unburdened by the has been. They want, if you want to introduce something so radical, so different, you want to destroy the past so yeah. that uh, um, people will forget where they're from and they will accept the new ideology in China in during the Cultural Revolution, that's Maoism. And that they're doing the same here. The new ideology is uh, wokeness. It is uh, really Maoism with American characteristics. One of the things that's really interesting about this stuff is it always seems to play on the good intentions of the, the people. So, it, you know, wokeism, when you, if you only go just barely under the surface, it sounds good. It's like, well, yeah, I don't want, I, I'm, I don't want to be racist. I don't, I, I care about people. I want equality, but then you go deeper and it, it's like, oh, that's not quite what's being pursued. It's a bit different than that. And you, uh, you notice this with the wording of things. They always have more benign names than what's really going on. And I mean, China's current army is the, uh, the people's liberation army. You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's like, well, who doesn't want to be liberated, right? Yeah. Like it, it always has this better sounding name than what it is. Re-education camps. <laughs> I, I would love for you to go into what, what were the, uh, I don't know if you'd call it double think or like, what were the, the names used for things, the way people were taught to think about things that didn't really align with reality? It was, that's really what uh, uh, Marxism communism is about. It is deceptive. It's a deception. And it's always used the best sounding words, best sounding slogans to lure the supporters. Yeah. And so in the, uh, uh, the Chinese communist revolution and the slogan was uh, overthrow three mountains that uh, oppress Chinese people, uh, feudalism. What what exactly it means? I don't know. That means the old old China, okay? Yeah. Uh, imperialism, and and that's uh, you know obvious. That's the Western imperialism. So it's the three so called three mountains that oppress the Chinese people: uh, feudalism, imperialism and capitalism. Mm. And so, because those were the ones 
that oppressed Chinese people. They were the source of Chinese people's suffering. And the Chinese uh, Communist Party is all about the liberation. They're going yeah. to get rid of uh, landlord, um, capitalists, and foreign uh, imperialists. So in the beginning, that was the slogan also. And Mao promised equity, exactly the same thing, equity, so that everyone will have equal chance uh, to succeed. Um, and the, uh, especially the peasants, because peasants uh, considered, consisted of like 90%, uh, more than 90% of the Chinese population. So he promised them free land. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's all so well, um, you know, it's so attractive. That's why they got such popular support from the Chinese people. And I try to remind uh, Americans, in 1949, Chinese Communist Party had like, I would say, two thirds of the population in China supported, even more. It is yeah. the absolutely the most popular um, political party in China. And because they have this popular support, they were able to defeat the nationalists and, and the rose to power. And it's not like they just got the uh, uh, revolution and uh, defeated the nationalists. Absolutely not. My parents, both of them, joined the revolution in 1949, and they're both from where to do family. They absolutely bought this lie, and they, they, they absolutely believe socialism was the solution for China, and it's the solution for the Chinese problems. And so, yeah, mm. lie, lie yeah. and more lies. But in, uh, in America, it's different. In America, because in China, you know, back then, it was like an endless, endless wars, several wars and wars um, from the uh, aggression from Japan. It was just endless suffering. And when you promise people something like, uh, you know, equity, socialism, when everyone will have the same opportunity, it sounds really, really, it's easy to, to, uh, to uh, um, convince people. But here, uh, America is the freest country in the world. And mm. how do you uh, convince people that they need to join the revolution and overthrow the system? And that's, you know, really, really a good question. And, uh, and, and, and that's really because they control the educational system. And we talk a little bit about this already. They mm. have to destroy the past so that uh, they believe that, uh, you know, they can build something better. And that's what uh, Obama's uh, campaign slogan, right? Forward and hope. And mm. now we got a uh, uh, common as hope, forward and future, same thing. And um, so we can talk a little more about uh, the uh, um, uh, history and how they erase history and rewrite history. And that's exactly what happened in China. That's exactly what happened during the Cultural Revolution when this, the, uh, the Red Guards had absolutely no knowledge of their past. And they believe in, a in anything that Mao told them. And they were willing to do anything that Mao asked them to do because mm. they absolutely was cut off from the past, from their heritage. And uh, so when you don't know the past, you were more likely to believe any lies told to you. Yeah. You mentioned equity, and uh, it's one of those words that I don't, it's not usually defined when it's being used, but uh, in the US, obviously, we're, we're about equality. Um, the civil rights movement was about extending rights to everyone where they weren't being applied already. And it's about giving everyone an equal chance to excel and and create a good life for themselves. But equity is everyone ends up in the same place. So it's quite different, which it doesn't make sense because people pursue different things. People have yeah. different interests and people put in different amounts of work. Some people don't want to put in work. Some people are happy, you know, just doing the bare minimum and, and having, you know, mediocre possessions, whatever. Some people are really driven to, 
you know, have really good lives and, and they want more material possessions. And um, whether that's, you know, whether you agree with them wanting that, that's the right to pursue what they want. Um, equity would mean no matter what effort you put in, no matter what an, anyone wants, uh, the results are predetermined likely by the government. So I want that's uh, the key. Yeah. The end the, the result was not determined by people, right? It's by yeah. the government. Yeah. Well, socialism, a lot of people, I, I actually know some people, uh, a lot of people my age and younger than me actually are see socialism and even communism as favorable. I was speaking to, I've been friends with him for 20 years. I was speaking to somebody over text. I saw him this weekend. He is more favorable to socialism and communism. He actually made a comment to me today saying, well, they don't teach communism in schools. And I'm like, I agree with that, but I don't yeah. think we're, our minds are in the same place. They don't teach communism in schools because people who are uh, communist sympathizers basically took over the education system in the 60s. And since then, it hasn't really been taught by in any schools at all. And he's, he tried to blame McCarthyism for it. And I said, McCarthyism was in the 40s and 50s. After that, there was no, like, no repercussions for people who wanted to push that ideology. So I don't, it's interesting the, the different ways people will view that. Um, but he did, uh, I asked him, I, I told him about this interview coming up. And I said, is there anything you would want to know? from somebody who lived that. And uh, I have to laugh at it because the question he wanted to know is, was there anything you liked about what, what happened back then? Yeah, I can tell you one thing. I can tell you something I like about it is that uh, you don't have to make any decisions. Yeah. And yeah. because everything decision was made for you. So make yeah. your life simpler, very simple. You just do what you're told to do. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. That was when people asked me what was the first culture shock for me. And I said, choices. Oh, mm -hmm. my goodness. I have so many choices. Um, just, just about everything I do, I have choices. Yeah. And in the beginning, it was really overwhelming. I'm so used to be told what to do. And uh, so now I have to make choices. And even just shopping, I have, I have, oh my God, the choices I have to, uh, I, I have to make was just overwhelming. And in the, um, when I attended, uh, college for the first time, I, I, I learned there was such a thing as choose your courses. Never happened. No. It's like, uh, this is the course, uh, for, for this year. That's it. Take it. There's no, there's no, there's no choices. In my life, where I, I can live, made by the government, and uh, and then later, of course, how many children you can have, it's made by the decision was made by the government. If you have uh, more than, um, if you have an uh, un, uh, approved pregnancy, you're dragged to the hospital and have a forced abortion. So, if hmm. you want a simpler life, go for socialism. Everything, everything was made for you. Everything decision, you don't have to make much decision. I'm really happy you said that because I, I talked to uh, somebody else in a previous interview months ago. And, you know, we talked about how some people that came from communism actually have a positive uh, impression of communism. They actually kind of long for those days sometimes. And that was kind of, well, that was my my thought on that, I think that the reason that people long for it is for that very reason, is because if you're failing in America where you have choices, where you have the ability to, I mean, you're responsible for your choices and you fail, that's really hard because it's your fault. Like it, exactly. it is, it's on you. But if you're failing, even if your conditions are worse in a communist country, it's not your fault. It's somebody else's and fault. Also. For a lot of people, for the people, especially those people who either don't have talent or don't want to put extra work and, and they prefer socialism because, you know, everyone look about, about the same. Yeah. And uh, so, as you said, it's not my fault. 
It's, it's just the way it is. And that was so hard for the Chinese when the uh, um, when China started to open up and immediately, almost immediately, I was still there. Uh, I came here in 86. I remember in early 80s and uh, people were able to do some business and make money. And I remember there is a, uh, there is a, um, a district that people could sell stuff they would go to, uh, you know, I'm from the inland city of Chengdu. They would go to uh, Guangzhou next to Hong Kong and bring some uh, some uh, new goods and sell it, of course, for a profit. And I remember there is a very famous uh, guy. He was selling mosquito nets. Uh, yeah, this is like, you know, in, in back then in China, everyone has to have a mosquito net at home. Otherwise, you can't go to sleep. And yeah. He was able to uh, get mosquito nets and then sell it and become so-called a millionaire. And the people would go there to to see him. And he's just like, what? He's nobody. He not did not have uh, education. And this kind of resentment, even for me, it's like, who is him to make that much money? I am a, a, a college professor back then, you know, and... Mm. Uh, he made this kind of money. And that was, uh, people just have a hard time to get used to it. Before it's like, a, if you're a good worker, you're a bad worker, it doesn't matter. Everyone makes the same money. Yeah. And so if I'm a teacher um, uh, in high school or or, uh, or college, over the country, it's the same, same uh, uh, salary because the, the central government decides. So there's no mystery. We know exactly how much. It's just about everyone kind of equal, but it's, of course, never equal because the ruling class, they have everything. But this, this is something that happened to a lot of uh, people um, in the uh, uh, former communist country. I remember I, I, I went to uh, Georgia, uh, Republic of Georgia, and I talked to them. And it's the same thing. This uh, kind of free market economy disrupted this communist system, all of a sudden, some people get more, uh, uh, some, some people just get more money and some people just kind of uh, um, left behind. And that was difficult. But that was the natural order of things. Some mm -hmm. people just like say, some people just more talented and some people just more hardworking with bit of, a little bit of luck. Some people will always do better than the rest. But the uh, communism just say that is not uh, right. That's not fair. So they want to correct it by the force of the government. Yeah. The government, yeah, will we'll, we'll correct it. Well, you use a word that kind of registers is uh, resentment. Yeah, and, resentment, and that's what absolutely. That's what uh, these ideologies, socialism, communism, collectivist ideologies, kind of capitalize on that feeling of resentment that is i mean a lot of people have resentment for different things and it's a really it's a really bad emotion um, yeah it is to, uh, yeah to harbor on. but it's human nature too yeah but you you see this i mean you see bernie sanders for instance he said you know there should be no billionaires and that sounds good because like most of us we don't have a ton of money so a billion is like it's unfathomable to yes, us. So it's yeah. like, why does anybody need Why that? do they even need it? Yeah. Yeah. But then if you say, okay, that's no billionaires. So no one can have over a billion dollars. Okay. Well, should anyone have over 900 million? What about 800 million? Yeah. That still seems like a lot. What about a hundred million? That's a lot of money. Does anyone really need a hundred million? Okay. What about, what about 50? What about 10? Okay. What number? Well, is actually too much. Well, um, uh, Bernie Sanders already made that decision. It's yeah. okay to be a millionaire. It's just bad to be a billionaire. Uh, once he become a billionaire, he will say probably a billionaire is okay. Just yeah. trillion, tri uh, trillionaire, I don't know. It's bad, I don't know. It is yeah. arbitrary. And uh, I, I think once, uh, if we are free, we are, we will never be equal. No. When I say equal, we're talking about the material outcome, right? It's not about value. 
That is the thing. You know, equality in America is an equal opportunity,、yeah. and the equal also means we are equal in the eyes of our Creator. But there's nowhere, you know,、um, and in Christianity or in American funding, say that we all should be end up in the same place. That's totally communism. Absolutely,、yeah. communism. So, if we are not, if we are equal, we will not be free. Only、mm. a government like totalitarian communism can make it happen. So everyone end up have the same thing, which means really nothing. Yeah, yeah. I、uh, I had an interview with G. Edward Griffin、um, a few weeks ago, and he, you know, we started talking about capitalism. And he doesn't he doesn't like even using that word because he says the real battle is between collectivism and、word. individualism, and I tend、mm-hmm. to agree with that.、Um, but unfortunately, we have to use these words because they're used so much. We have to like talk around them a little bit. One of the things I wonder about because you know, like I mentioned, I have friends that are more、uh, they like socialism, they like communism, and. They, they don't think like. They like communism. They, they think, they, they, think do,、yeah. they like socialism. Most of them actually don't know much about it. They don't. Than, and I, I told my friend this. I, I said, you know, I want to go deep in this conversation, but it seems like you, we can't go beyond rhetoric. Like you, you can say rhetoric, you can use rhetoric, but beyond that, you don't really have much knowledge about what you seem to think is a good thing, and. One of the things I want to ask about is, I mean, first of all, do you have, are you running into wordplay a lot with this? Like people will say, China isn't communist; it's state capitalism. Things、mm-hmm. like that. It seems like capitalism is defined very, very broadly to mean anything going on with the current U.S. or Western society kind of system, which doesn't make sense to me because. The Federal Reserve is not capitalism. Bailouts—that's not capitalism. It's not. Yes.、Um, government creating monopolies for corporations, corporatism—all of these things are not really capitalism. And and I am—I'm definitely more favorable to capitalism, but I don't like the current system in the U.S. I think it's very flawed.、Mm-hmm. And do you feel like? Do you feel like you kind of get cornered with that, like? You're almost forced to defend aspects that are associated with capitalism that aren't really capitalism in condemning communism. It is complicated because the word they use, also because the media does not really help to、yeah. explain.、Uh, especially China now seems to be、uh, made itself an example of uh, that. Uh, Capitalism and communism can work together, right, to create so-called state, uh, uh, to create something better. Basically, that is what uh, the uh,、um, a lot of uh, the uh,、um, the Marxists or the globalists like to call the um, the uh,、um, uh, China model.、Mm. But people, especially the、uh, the media, they, it does not help to. Educate、uh, American. So I think that、uh, we have problem with all these terminologies.、So、all of them are really, really troublesome. First of all, the word capitalism was uh, uh, invented by Karl Marx. So when you when he used the word capitalism, what's the first thing people think about it when they think about、uh, capitalism? Money, right?、Yeah. Think about capital. And、yeah. they think about、uh, money and the dirty and this exploitation. So it is not a correct word, but we kind of stuck with it. the The right word to use is free market.、Yeah. Free market is a better word. I'm trying my best when I use it,、um, but mostly, you know, we we just use the、uh, old term capitalism. Okay,、yeah. so is China a capitalist country? That's a lot of young people believe it. They and、uh, I know them because I argue with them on social media. So they said China is no longer a communist country, and China is a capitalist country. So let's see. Let's still use the word capitalism. Okay,、um, what has to be there in order to even have capitalism? 
you got to have private ownership, correct? Yeah. Yeah, that's almost like a, a must, and you must have a free market, free from the the manipulation of the government, and you have to have a、uh, rule of laws. Yeah, reinforced by the government. That's what government、mm, should do. Does China、yeah. have that? None of those. China have no private ownership of natural resources. You can own your stuff.、Yeah. You can own your stuff. You know nowadays,、um, but you know the government can take away. You know、yeah. Jack Ma. What happened to、yeah. him? Billionaire. Overnight, everything is gone. Okay,、yeah. but no one in China owns natural resources, and that started after 1949. That the uh, Chinese uh, uh, government、um, they used the、uh, land reform, confiscated all the land from the rich and gave to the poor. So the poor was like, "Oh, great! I'm so glad we supported communists." Now we have free land. It、yeah. only lasted four or five years, and everything was taken back by collectivization called People's Commune. So all the land were taken from the hands of the peasants. You don't need to have individual ownership. We're going to call it People's Commune. Now all the land belong to people, belong to every one of us. You know,、yeah. of course, it's a trick. We can tell right away. So since then. There is no ownership of land, of forest, of water, of nothing. Everything was owned by the government. So China, for that alone, is not a capitalist country, and China's market is not free because the party decide, you know, controls everything, and、uh, there's no rule of law because the party is the law. Who、uh, got rich、uh, in the past decades? Not the the、uh, the peasants who were the cheap labor that made China rich, and、uh, not the ordinary people. They are all CCP ruling class.、Yeah. They got billions, trillions of dollars in each family. Yeah. For what? From what? Corruption. So China is not. A capitalist country, so for that I think that's absolutely、um, we have to. You know, I try my best to、yeah. educate those, those young people. China is not a free、um, uh, country. China is not a capitalist country. Capitalism really equals to freedom, free market. It's、um, everything about capitalism is on voluntary、um, basis. You.、Yeah. Yeah, you may not like、uh, the salary that、uh, a business、uh, willing to pay. You can walk away. In socialist country, you can't walk away. That is it. You、yeah. have a job, and that's the government、uh, that gave you that job. That's it. You have no choice. Especially in Mao's China, you cannot even move to another place. You can. You have to stay where you happen to be. Uh, when、yeah. the、uh, communists took over,、uh, that's why in in China people stuck in the same place for decades. They can't just go and change jobs. There's no such thing. Everything was controlled, and、um, so it's not free. So China is not a capitalist country. I don't know where you wanted the conversation to go, but、yeah. that is something that now if if I argue with someone, I just said, if you don't have ownership. A private ownership of land,、um, of natural resources, you can't have capitalism. So China,、yeah. to me, is that they got the capital from the West, but they never got capitalism from the West. It's still com-、um, socialism, communist country. Yeah, and you know, in the U.S., we have. We definitely have private ownership, but one of the things that has been infringed upon is we don't we don't have a free market in many markets anymore.、Um, Not much been, anymore, yeah. Yeah, you know, like a great example is the bailout of GM that happened.、Yes. I think that was under Obama, and、uh, that's not a free market. 
because no, under, under a free market, what happens is that business goes bankrupt and somebody else buys it for pennies on the dollar and then builds it into something, you know, hopefully great again. But then instead of that, we had the government step in and say, no, no, we have to protect the jobs and we have to do all of this stuff, which those jobs would have come back eventually anyway. So instead they, they bail them out. And then this company that doesn't manage its money very well, that doesn't actually manage its business gets propped up by the government. And it has, I mean, it's a major market player in the industry. That's not a free market. And I, yeah, I think it's not the government doing this. I think it's the, the corporations yeah. and the big business, they own the government. Yeah, that, so exactly. The, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. And we are losing freedom everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and this is this is a, a big part of the problem when it comes to discussing, you know, socialism and communism versus capitalism is the the pro socialist and communist people will kind of force the capitalists to defend everything that's going on in the current system. But in the reality, the reality is most people, even pro capitalist people, want to see the system changed. They just want to see capitalism preserved and the, the corruption, the corporatism, the Federal Reserve, they want to see all that stuff getting gotten rid of in the system. So it's, it's one of these, it's one of the things that makes these conversations difficult with the people that support communism and socialism is because you're just, there are problems with the system. But it's like the answer is fixing the system. It's not yes, yes, going to a yeah. different system. You know? I, I think in, in many ways, the easiest way to understand communism is it's all about control. Yeah. It's all about control. Control every aspect of people's lives. Of course, including economy, everything. What you can think, what you can say, what, you, what information you can access, everything. Yeah. So... That's, I think, the, the key word, and it's the easiest way to let people know. If you want to be controlled, also, you, you, you may say, hey, I want to be taken care of, so I want to be controlled. Then you go with communism. But the communism is not really about taking care of. You have to understand that. So it is in the name of taking care of people mm -hmm. that uh, you give up your freedom, and you can definitely work uh, vote your way into communism and they will promise everything and then when they deliver just be prepared they will yeah. deliver nothing and we have just next door we have an example of uh, Venezuela they promised you know socialist utopia they yeah. delivered poverty hunger and death some people will differentiate between socialism and communism, and they'll say, well, I don't support communism, I support socialism. Um, in my opinion, communism is the natural end result of socialism, because there's no way to actually have socialism where, you know, the people own the means of production, what, that's what they say they want. There's actually no way to make that happen without the government making sure that it happens. And once you allow the government to make sure that happens, there's no reason for the government to stop there. So oh, yeah. eventually you're going to end up in communism. Would would that be pretty accurate? Okay. I know there's uh, different definitions of uh, socialism and communism. And uh, so, and in my book, I explain what I learned in China and uh, of uh, the definitions of those terms. Um, so China... It's not a communist country. If you ask the Chinese government, if you ask the Chinese people, and they call China socialist, mm. um, but it's uh, um, led by a communist party. So technically, there's no communist country in the world. Why? So what I was taught is socialism is in the initial stage of communism. Yeah. So when do we get into communism is when the entire world becomes socialist. Hmm. That's when we become communist. Uh, so in, in many ways, communist, communism is globalism. So it's one government, you know, or, or one party, one of 
for the whole entire world. That's when we have communism. So in many ways, socialism is communism. It's the same thing. In the book, in your book, you, you mentioned, well, first of all, the sickle and hammer, it represents work. But in the book, you mention a phrase that was uh, propped up by the party, by Mao. It was work make work makes one free. Is that right? Yeah, it's a, 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 they did not say that exactly because that's a Nazi slogan, right? Yeah, yeah. But that's what uh, um, uh, that's the narrative yeah. is uh, work, uh, labor, hard physical labor purify you. Hmm. Uh, how? Because uh, what the problem the uh, socialists and communists fight against is bourgeois, bourgeois yeah. ideology. Uh, and what is bourgeois? I, I have to admit, I just found out recently what it really means. Do you know what it really means, bourgeois? I know loosely what it means. Like bourgeois means basically people that have more than me. Actually, it's uh, that's what I thought. Yeah. No, actually, it's more than that. Bourgeois really means middle class. Hmm. Because uh, Karl Marx was not against the uh, the super rich. The uh, when when I say super rich, those landed class, right in Europe through the feudalism. That's the real thing. Feudalism. You get land. Your ancestor have land. You can trace your ancestry back to generations. You, uh, those people are the rich who are bourgeois. Those who are not landed class. Those people are the entrepreneurs. They open factory yeah. like the Dutch. They started to trade. They were not landed class. They were basically the capitalists. They, uh, create wealth. Many of them from thin air, you know, they have an idea and then they put it into practice. They make something and they made fortune. So bourgeois really means uh, middle class or you can say entrepreneurs. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that's what they're really after. They are not up because those people are independent. Those people um, cannot be easily controlled. So the whole uh, a time I was in, uh, in Mao's China, we just have to get rid of the bourgeois ideology. I don't have no clue what it is. And I know, um, the only thing I know is bourgeois is like, uh, you want to live a comfortable life. You want to desire something good. You want to, uh, um, uh, you, you, you want to avoid hard labor. So to us, that is bourgeois. So what's the best cure for bourgeois ideology? Hard work, yeah. physical labor. So that will purify you. So make you what? Make you more like a proletarian. Yeah. Those are the words we grew up with. Bourgeois, proletarian. Bourgeois bad, proletarian good. Yeah. Proletarian is noble is uh, is uh, um, need to be glorified and how do you become uh, more um, bourgeois uh, a more proletarian especially if you're from a bourgeois family you try to look you you, you try to uh, talk tough you try to curse you try to behave like uh, you never had the education because the education was the problem so there's so many people including my father try to be more like a, a proletarian and uh, and uh, like here um, the problem is whiteness and how do you become better you get rid of your whiteness yeah. right be less white it's the same thing it's it's just so being white or the whiteness now is the new bourgeois yeah. that the communists or the socialists are against. Yeah. Luckily, I'm not white uh, because uh, somebody's going to have to define exactly what white means. I don't know. what well, well, You're white yeah. to me. I don't know. Well, well, that's one of the things with like the proletariat, the bourgeoisie, uh, bourgeois, uh, it's 
they're elusive concepts. They're not easy to define. Exactly. And these are things that collectivism, they use this because, okay, let's say in the U.S., uh, white and black, they talk about white and black a lot. And people will purport to speak for, let's say, the black community. But there's actually no way to prove that they're actually representing and speaking for the black community black, yeah. because there's no, first of all, the it, it's not easy to define what the black, well, even the, the word community is not really right to use because a community is one that you opt into, not one that you're just lumped into so people can speak about you. But they use these words to put you in a group and then the definition of what's in the group can change over time. And it seems like that that happened in China where it's like you you have to be revolutionary. Like, oh, well, you have to you're not revolutionary enough. Like so that the definition keeps changing. They did that in the Soviet Union with the word oh, uh, yeah. the kulaks who were basically the landlords in the Soviet mm -hmm. Union. But the, the definition changed over time to where like the kulaks were basically anyone that owned anything and to be called a kulak was an insult. And it, it seems like collectivists tend to use these words where they can, they can change the meaning of the word depending on what they want to achieve in that, that context. Yes, it's basically, it's not about... Uh being bourgeois or proletarian. Yeah. And what they're really trying to do is that, I already said that, is the bourgeois ideology. Yeah. And it's the proletarian ideology. So in China, okay, if you are poor, you are, uh, you are uh, proletarian. You can be accused of being bourgeois because somehow you, uh, you were uh, considered uh, that you desire good stuff. You desire fine things in, yeah. uh, in, in life and you will be accused of uh, being a bourgeois. And uh, so, so it's not really about uh, exactly haves or have nots. It's really about uh, a, an idea that somehow um, that's um, represent. So they're really going after ideas. And here, you know, um, and just like in China, um, if you are born a bourgeois, uh, you can have redemption. And so you can denounce yourself, commit yourself to study Marxism and Maoism, and uh, uh, get dirty, look dirty, talk dirty, and then uh, commit it to the course, uh, to the cause of communism you might be saved. Hmm. And so here too. So if you want to uh, be accepted, you can't be just say, I'm not a race. I'm not a racist. You have to commit to become uh, anti-racist as you described yeah. in the beginning of our conversation. Same thing. Absolutely. Same thing. You hmm. can't, you can save yourself. Yeah. But that means really means commit yourself to the new ideology and denounce everything about you, about your old self. You mentioned in the book that there is this culture uh, during the Cultural Revolution of like telling, like everyone was snitching on each other, like people would tell on each other for different things. Is that all to be in the good graces of those that are watching? Like if I tell on you for being uh, anti-revolutionary, then that proves that I'm revolutionary. Is that kind of the reason yes. for that? I think that's really the, uh, the, the motivation. Yeah. So I, and now we, we talked about that already. Communism is really about control. And how do you control a population? Um, you know, you can't have secret police in every household. So you encourage people to report each other and then you uh, will reward those people who report their neighbors, their family, you know, whoever. And those people will be rewarded. And because of that, especially some people and um, who have political disadvantage, um, maybe from a bad family or what, 
those people sometimes work overtime to report others so that they can be rewarded and may, maybe uh, made some advances in their po um, political career. Yeah. And then that is very, very effective. That make the, you know, that means you make every person a secret police. Yeah. Yeah, it's a par parents report children, children report parents, neighbor, you know, it's just after wife report husband and the other way around. It is absolutely no, so, so that, that's why everyone lies. And so the end result is uh, um, the society become just built on lies. Everyone yeah. lies because they don't trust anyone else. And when I grew up, there was one place you can hear people telling the truth. And guess what? You will never guess. It's on the train. Interesting. Why is that? Because no one knew each other. Mm, and after, after, you know, you get off the train, you're all gone. And I was, remember, I was, um, I was like a high school and a later college. I took some long, um, train ride. And people are so open, talk about all sorts of things. What kind of thing? They complain. They complain about the government and whatever. And then everyone is gone. Yeah. And because people do have the need to tell the truth. It is in us that we want to tell what we believe. We want to yeah. share it with, uh, you know, with people we know or don't know or whatever. So it's really funny. So in the, in, in a situation like that, you hear people because people stuck with each other for hours and you hear all, I learned so much about how bad things were because I was just a student and yeah. to hear people complain about the factories, complain about everything. And it's just eye opener for me. You were, you were sent to, uh, what are they called? Cause you were sent to work in the fields for like three years, right? Yeah, it's so it's called, uh, up the mountain, down to the countryside hmm. for the young people to yeah. get re-education by the peasants. With, with the with the snitching, did you feel that in the COVID atmosphere? I mean, Tim Waltz had a snitch yeah. line in his state, um, but even without the government's involvement, people were, I saw it everywhere. Like people were yelling at each other for, I saw one person I knew, he was scolding people on social media uh, for not wearing masks, and mm -hmm, and yeah. he was he was uh, basically he didn't wear a mask when seeing one of his friends, and he was like saying how bad he felt for that. And it, like it was a really weird atmosphere where people are at each other's throats for yeah. not adhering to the government protocols. But then, obviously, with you know Tim Walls creating a line for people to actually report their neighbors and things like that. Does that kind of bring you back to that atmosphere, that feeling? Yeah, I think uh, COVID is the time that we see, a, we, we saw a lot of it. But even yeah. before that, I saw it in my workplace. So I think it's, um, it's about 2010-ish. And uh, there's a, uh, one of my black coworker. We are friends. We're really kind of close. Yeah. Um, so she somehow decided not, this is not her idea. Probably the people she, political association she had outside the work. So she want to create a DNI council, uh, diversity and inclusion. Back mm -hmm. then it's equity was introduced in 2020. Yeah. Okay. So she wanted me to be part of the uh, council. I was like, uh, okay, I have no, really not enough idea about what that was all about. I thought it was helping the workplace. It's not sure. And then soon after I got into that uh, council, I realized that was not what I thought. And it was really, they have agenda. But back then, and she said, we need to tell people, see something, say something. And what she meant is racism, racist comment. And she called me several times of saying things that are incorrect, politically correct, uh, according to her standard. And, uh, so, and, and eventually I, I decided 
um, to, to, to leave. And I yeah. have a big argument with her. And then I decided to leave. And I think that is really BS. Hmm. But see something, say something. That to me is the snitch yeah. culture. That yeah. uh, because of that, people become more careful with each other. People like coworker that we used to joke around. People, I, I can see that the culture start to change. That people yeah. just have to be really watch out for what they say. So that's like a cultural revolution. So what you say or what you do is that you either lie or you don't say anything or you say a bunch of nothing. You have a small talk and you just avoid anything serious. And that become a culture even before COVID. I was like, this is bad. I yeah. thought the snitch culture in China was, was specifically Chinese. No, 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 no. Now it's here. It's an after COVID. It become really part of the mainstream culture. You absolutely report. So and so says so, uh, whatever. And then we have struggle session, right? We have yeah. struggle session nowadays online and you have to go and confess. And we just uh, um, think about that uh, boxer, the Italian boxer. And I was beaten up by uh, a trans, uh, trans woman or man mm. or whatever. And then she said something that was truthful that she was beaten by a man. Then, then what? Something happened. Yeah. Yep. She came out and confessed she was wrong. And, uh, so always good. So yeah. With the, with the struggle sessions, I read somewhere that people were put into a, a position. Uh, they call it, uh, Robert Green called it a jet plane position yeah it's like a painful I, I, position i, I did a, a a tweet i think two days ago i i came across this photo i said this is a perfect photo it's called jet uh plane position just basically have your arm you know backward and the two uh two uh two people will hold your arm as high and push your head down so you your arms are up in the air mm. it was a very painful position for a long time you know they hold you and you know hours like that yeah. and the picture I found was really really good because there are two people on the stage being denounced being struggled against one yeah. was a male held by two men another is a female uh held by two uh two women and the men they were just like okay they were not really serious about the position, but those two women, again, they want to outdo men. They push their victim so down and, uh, and her up, her arms so up. That was really painful. Some people broke their arms in that kind of position. Yeah. And, uh, it's, it's just show, show, uh, show, uh, you have the power over them. Yeah. And, and, and that's very common. Have you seen, the opening scene of the uh, new, well, not any, not that new, but a Netflix uh, series called uh, Three Body Problems. I have, yeah. You have. I, I think yeah. a lot of people was like shocked. Really? Yes, really. That's exactly what happened in the ch Cultural Revolution. Many of people were beaten uh, to death right there. I did not witness. I witnessed the uh, struggle session for the governor of my province. And uh, I did not say beating, but they're beating everywhere, especially, especially on campuses, in, uh, in schools and universities, because the police were not allowed to go to the campuses. And that's where the most brutal violence took place. And sometimes, Sometimes the purpose of these struggle sessions is to get a confession to somebody else that's anti-revolutionary or something like that, isn't it? Say it again. Sometimes the purpose of them was to get information on other anti-revolutionaries. Oh, it's not information. Right? It's the information is all made up. Well, yeah. I think they push I, you. I think the, the real purpose is, of course, to, uh, to humiliate and denounce whoever, you know, the victim. Also yeah. to show to the crowd. It's always a crowd. Always everyone was required uh, in, in to go. So if there is a struggle session in the workplace, everyone has to go. Just to show the others, you'd better behave. 
if you do what this guy or this woman did, this is what's going to happen to you. Well, yeah. I mean, you said it's made up, and I believe that because if you're if you're putting somebody in a really uncomfortable and you know painful position, these people that are putting them, you know, the people conducting the struggle sessions, they look bad if. If you're supposed to denounce, they're trying to get some you to denounce somebody. They look bad if you don't denounce somebody because then yeah, they're operating you on bad show information. You are a committed revolutionary. Yeah. I have to tell you what happened to my uncle, and he was a, a high school principal. So, um, and he of course joined the rev uh, cultural revolution, participate, and do uh, did whatever he was supposed to do. And he was really my my uncle was a very neat guy. He always cleaning, you know what? So in China, you we have a duster um, back then using the uh, the uh, the chicken feather, you know, and made a duster. And yeah. he would just go and dust things. So there is a mouse bust in his office. He was just dusting everything. His students saw him dusting mouse bust and reported that he was uh, weeping Mao hmm. and because of that and he had a struggle session and he had to admit that um, um, he had to he had to admit the reason he did that is because he has deep uh, held hatred for Mao uh, it's full of the, that kind of story yeah when I when I listened to your interview with Brian, he pointed out that Mao turned anti-government rhetoric in his favor. So he, he took the anti-government rhetoric, turned it into his favor. And it seems, it seems like I see that right now in the U S cause it's like, people are, people are frustrated and rightly so in a lot of regards, but then the same people we've done this for a long time, but the same people who cause the problems act like they're going to solve the problem. So it's like, yeah, you know, no, that was a problem. We're going to fix it. We caused it, but we're fixing it. So it's like this weird, weird atmosphere where like everything negative said about the government is somehow going to be fixed by that same government. And that connection isn't always obvious for people. I don't know. It's kind of weird. I don't know why. I thought American people, you know, for Chi uh, for Chinese, they have excuse. They never uh, knew what freedom was. They yeah. never lived on uh, in freedom. They never had any rights. The rights are always from the rulers, yeah. and uh, so I can, you know, they can be excused, but not here. Why people become so 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 uh, indoctrinated that they lost their basic. Uh, uh, the ability to make a judgment for themselves. Uh -huh. I don't know. I, 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 the only thing I can say is the power of indoctrination. Yeah. That they don't see. They call Trump a dictator. And what they did is absolutely dictatorship. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have my problems with Trump. I, I, there's some things I don't like about him, but at the same time, and you mentioned uh, in your book, you talk about how Mao's predecessor or yeah, successor, the person who succeeded him was basically demonized and that if you win up them. And that and that's kind of what happens with Trump. And it, it's interesting because like not that Trump was perfect or anything like that, because he definitely had his flaws and has his flaws. But the they act like everything bad going on is the guy who was there for four years is fault, even though Democrats have been in power 12 years out of the last uh, 16 years. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, the establishment in America has been in power for decades, you know, like the, the Republican and Democrat parties weren't really that different for a while. The, the big difference is kind of Trump right now with his movement and uh, the, the two party system which is horrible. They, the people who've been in charge for a while are acting like they're the solution. It's just, and the person who was there for four years is somehow the cause of everything, but 
the problem started long before Trump ever got into office. I I personally don't think that um, you, you can compare this to Trump did not have the kind of power. He only was elected uh, four years and he had to find people that he can work with. It's totally different from Mao. Yeah. Mao was like, he had power and he, um, it, it's just one after another. The people that closest to him always will be, will always have very, very bad ending. It's because he never trust anyone. Yeah. He, um, one of his successor was uh, Liu Shaoqi. He was the president of China. Actually, he was the one that after Mao was uh, uh, put into the back seat, he was the one really started to run the country and his focus was on improve the economy. And uh, in, inside the party, he got a lot of respect and people really um, respect and follow him. And that is why Mao want to get rid of him. And yeah. so he become the uh, uh, the number one victim of Mao's Cultural Revolution. And he had a very sad ending. And he was uh, uh, purged and um, not imprisoned, but kind of uh, um, exiled and died alone uh, without uh, any medical care. And uh, so basically led to die. And his second, um, successor handpicked somehow Mao suspect that he want to overthrow him. Hmm. And then, so this guy was a little smarter. He knew that uh, uh, there's no uh, chance for him to survive. So he, he, he tried to flee the country and his plane crashed. We still hmm. don't know whether it's crashed uh, with accident or shot down, he was gone. And after that, no one wants to be his successor. Yeah. So the, the person who was the biggest victim, what was his name? Um, the second one, Lin Biao. The first one, the, the... Liu Shaoqi. Okay. Was he, was he called evil? Was he like demonized as... Oh my God. Yeah. This is something I really want to tell uh, American people. And it's the same old trick. And if you don't like your enemy, you demonize him. Mm -hmm. So Liu Shaoqi was really respected, at least within the party. Outside the party, people still think that Mao was the number one, and they still really um, uh, have a, um, revere him almost like a god. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you uh, overnight say your successor was a bad guy? Well, he did. He uh, gave uh, all sorts of label on this on Liu Shaoqi, and he become a traitor. He become a number one uh, uh, capitalist roader. Capitalist roader means someone who take the road to capitalism. Yeah. And uh, and he was number one China's Kuchnev. Kuchnev, the guy that after Stalin in Khrushchev. Russia. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, and because Mao said that, Overnight, everyone believed that he was a bad guy. Yeah. And then he did the same thing to Lin Biao. And that was really, really shocking uh, news when we heard that he uh, uh, tried to escape and fled yeah. to Soviet Union and was shot down. And uh, so he was a traitor. He always, Mao, all, all the way, um, all along knew that he was a traitor and because Mo have to prove that he was not uh, mistaken. He knew all the way along, you know, all those things that people just believed that. And yeah. overnight, yeah, enemy of the state. It sounds a lot like, I mean, it, it sounds similar to Trump because I mean, Trump was in the good favors of the Democrats until he yeah, ran for president. Yeah, they love him, right? Yeah. Yeah, and now I actually find it kind of real, really scary how much control the Democratic Party and and some Republicans are able to exert on people purely based on how much they can convince people to hate Trump and not think of him as a human. Because that is dehumanization. Is yeah. 
absolutely part of it. Um, so I, I also uh, wrote this in my book. And I did not even think about it when I was in China. So when I was writing the book, and then it occurred to me that there are two, uh, there, there is a word in, in Chinese, and it's renmin, basically means people, hmm. in plural, people. Okay, so that should be people, right? Anybody. No, 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 no. In Chinese, in Mao's China, that word reserved to good people. Mm. So that means that when you part of the people, you are part of the revolution. You're a good guy. You're human. And yeah. uh, when you are purged or denounced, you become enemy. You are no longer part of the people. So it's automatic. It's an automatic switch. Once you're labeled enemy, you're no longer human. You're no longer part of the humanity. That's why the Red Guards could do anything. Anything to the enemy of the state is justified. It's yeah. an enemy. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it, 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 it's not even human. Yeah. That's what's ha happening here in America. There are a lot of people now come out to say, now they start to change their mind. But before they hate Trump so much, they don't know why. They just hate it. Of course, it's because of propaganda. Yeah. You know, media, educational system, even in school, the teachers teach the kindergartens, Biden good, Trump bad. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's this this idea that Trump is so bad that anything anything is better than him. And it's like, I, I thought, I used to think George W. Bush was the worst president of my lifetime. And then Biden got into office and I'm like, okay, Biden is the worst president of my lifetime. And I, I think, I think Kamala Harris would be worse than Biden. I think, uh, I think she's more, she's more under. She's a, she's a communist, if yeah. you ask me. And I have to tell you that well, how, uh, before, I think they're all the same. There's no difference. Yeah. Why I'm a Trump supporter? It's because everyone else was controlled. And uh, we don't really have uh, a really uh, representative government. Just like uh, we said earlier, it's been captured. It's yeah. been controlled by big business, by globalists, not even by the uh, American business. It's global. And it's yeah. the globalists that control our government. And that's why they hate Trump so much. So, so, so much because he can't be controlled for that Alone, I'm a supporter, absolute supporter. George W. Bush, big Bush, small Bush, whatever, Clinton, Obama, that's all the same to me. You know, it's it's interesting because the the number of or the influence of Marxism among the Democrat elites is really concerning. And in your book, you point out that Pete Buttigieg's uh, father is one who helped i forget the guy's name but he was the father of uh cultural marxism which is wokeism essentially a gramsci uh antonio gramsci yeah. yeah yeah so he helped that get popularized in america even translating his uh prison notebook i think is the name of it yes prison notebook yeah and that's interesting um and then you mention uh merrick garland's Yes, a son-in-law that son -in -law, has this uh, -in -law. business yeah. that sell anti or CRT, CRT yeah. um, curriculum material to like a half of the uh, of the country's uh, schools. Yeah, it's and like become, you know, school make districts. millions of dollars. Yeah, it's like fifteen hundred school districts across the country. This is uh, why I I am just so uh, passionate of uh, educating uh, American people. Yeah. Is we are in a communist revolution. But this revolution is cultural revolution because just like a Gramsci, Antonio Gramsci said, we, we, we can't beat ca uh, capitalism or free market uh, with uh, uh, the, the old fashioned revolution, like what happened in Russia and China. Uh, that won't work because there's no one joined their revolution. Those working class now are comfortably middle class. They're not gonna join the bloody revolution. The only way to defeat capitalism is to destroy their culture. 
replace the uh, hegemony um, with socialism. That's、yeah. what he said. So that's why it is so important for people to understand what happened in China during the Cultural Revolution. Because Mao knew that he he knew he could not、uh, use his army to overthrow his own government. That would look like really bad. Look like a coup.、Yeah. So he used the people, and he said, "People want this." Yeah. People want to overthrow the bad、uh, ruling class. He all, you know, he is just so evil. But he was really, really smart. Yeah. So everything, just like here, everything they're going to do, they're going to do it in the name of the people. Well, we in China you had the Red Guard. Those were the people that、um, supported Mao and basically acted like the. Police for him, you know the the army, more or less. It wasn't the official army, but it was essentially Mao's little army. And then in the U.S., we've seen Antifa,、uh, another one of those benign names. Who doesn't want to be anti-fat? Antifa,、right? yeah, BMM. Yeah.、Uh, who would disagree? You know,、yeah. social justice warriors. And now it's pro-Palestine. It's not. It's pro-Hamas. I said same. All the same. They say, did you notice that the and all these BMMers, Antifa, and social justice warrior, anti, anti-abortion activists, whatever. The, the the issues are different, but the one thing remains the same: they all hate America. They all want to destroy America, and they all want to burn American flags. So it's like issues are never the issues. The issue is revolution. Well, I think there are a lot of people like I. I have some cr- criticisms of Israel. I think、uh, you know I don't love what's happening, and I, I think there are some fair criticisms. I think what I see is there are a lot of people who only get barely under the surface of the issue, and they fall into these. I mean, when when you get into groupthink, you're no longer thinking. Like when you, you, you know, when you're part no, of a you group.、Don't. You're just yeah, letting the group follow,、yeah. take you wherever. So they, there are legitimate reasons for some of these causes, and they get roped into the group, and then they stop thinking, and they just get dragged along wherever it is. And I think that's a big problem because if you're that is if you're not thinking for yourself, if you're just going along with what the group is and not worried about the group taking it too far, which often they do, I think you have a、But、really big problem. Do you do you see the pattern? No matter what issues, no matter what, the goal is is the, America is the target. Yeah, that is a real. That really shows you, the issue is never the issue. It's、yeah. not like a, you know. Let's talk about uh, uh, Israel, Palestine, Hamas. No, no, they don't want that kind of discussion. Yeah, they're really not interested in any discussion, and they always ended up、uh, demonize America. Always,、yeah. every one of them, every one of those so-called revolution, and that's what happened in China too. Yeah, the well, issue yeah, you, is never the issue. You get these. You have this cause where, yeah, people see people dying in Palestine, and and they have a problem with that, and I can understand that. But then you get you know a group of a thousand people protesting, and you have, I don't know, a fifty to a hundred people that are extremists in the group. And they're the ones with the megaphones. They're the ones yeah, burning the yeah, flags. They they're the ones really driving the narrative, and and then you have the more reasonable people in there that are like, well, why are we lumped in with these? You know, why? I'm just against you know people being killed. You know, innocent people being killed. But it's like, yeah, but the thing, the people you're associating with to promote your cause don't want the same thing as you. They actually want the complete destruction of the United States. They're also, they are the same people. Yeah, really, they're interchangeable. They, they, they the same people that in the in the campuses, and and they every time there's something, they're out there protest that because the issue, as I said, the really the truth is the issue is never the issue. The、yeah. issue is always the revolution. Yeah. Then a revolution against what? Against America? Against our system? That is the key, and、uh, so it's that's why they're not interested in discussion. They're not interested in conversation. No, 
They just want to go there and protest, burn flags, vandalize everything, and、yeah. they know there's no consequence, just like the Red Guards. So I think a month ago or three weeks ago, the、uh, pro Hamas uh, activists uh, stormed the Capitol and then vandalized the statues in Union Station and then、uh, lowered, took down the American flags and raised the、uh, Hamas flag. Yeah, and then what? They were arrested before midnight. They're all released, no、yeah. problem. So they they are waiting for the next issue. It's just like、uh, you know, in my book, I think it's called Jer- Jerry. What's his name? And he said、uh, it's like、uh, you know,、um, we just want an excuse for our revolution. Now、yeah. it's a Vietnam War, but even if the war. And ended, or there's no such war. We created something. So、yeah. because their goal is to have revolution and overthrow, the goal is overthrow our system here. Yeah, yeah. It's it's really it is really scary what's happening, and it, it's yeah. And there is a book called the True Believers, and I think that book really、hmm. um, has a lot of truth in it. So what kind of people? Attracted to this mass movement, that's what I mean. The same people, mostly you can find that the, the, the same people. They were there. The same people that now in pro、uh, Hamas or pro Palestine, whatever, they were out there in 2020, burning everything down with the Black Lives Matter. Yeah, the same people. Well, and I, I truly believe this. I know some people who are.、Uh... Aligned with some of these movements, and I, I truly believe that they are very different people one on one than they are in the group. I don't think they're the same. Once they get in the group, there's no autonomy. There is no nuance.、Yes. There's no discussion, like you said. It's whatever the group wants. And the thing is, if you're in a group who is protesting, and then one of the people, like let's say you're protesting in a neighborhood, and one of the people protesting is like, I'm gonna. I'm gonna break into this house right here. No one's gonna stop them. They're like,、no. they're all going to. There's gonna be one person that breaks in, and then a couple more people are gonna come behind them. And even if that person breaks in, only with the intention of breaking that window. Once somebody else crosses that line, things just escalate, and that's how groups、yeah. work. And it is known, like the people who are、that's、really how, organizing this know that. That's how mobs work. Yeah, it's just. Yeah, like the Red Guards, the the first group of girls that killed the principal. If you now talk to them, yeah, well, nothing happened. That's another thing. No consequences. Yeah, but they are not monsters. Yeah, mobs are actually. I've I've had a, I guess a fear of mobs since a a young age because I watched like a riot on some TV show and I saw people throwing bottles. There was person. Climbing like a light post, and I was like, "That's terrifying!" Like, there's no if if the mob goes after you, there's no reasoning, there's no there's way to no, be like, "Hey guys, like, like this is a misunderstanding." No. Like, no, like once they're once they see you as the enemy, like you're done. It's you're down. Terrifying. That started in the French Revolution. Yeah, mobs. You know, it's it's non-stoppable.、Yeah. And、uh, but it is the、um, the revolution that created this kind of mobs. Yeah. One of one of the last things I wanted to ask you about is in your book you mention that you really didn't see the reality of what you were in until you left, until you got to America. Um. So that brings up an important question in. What about the people who are in the thick of it here? Who the people who are wrapped up in this,、uh, you know, pro-communism collectivist ideologies? If if you couldn't see it when you were in it, and and you were deep in it because like it was extreme at that time, how can people? Maybe you've reflected on this. Like, if you could go back and talk to yourself while everything was going on. How would you convince yourself, or how would you open your eyes in that time? Well, I don't think that's、uh, um, comparable to America、mm. because in China everything was controlled. Okay, every piece of information was controlled. 
every piece of narrative was pushed out uniformly across the country. You just don't have another way of knowing.、Mm. So most people follow little kids like me. I could not question. I would not be able to question. And people say, "Did you notice?"、Uh, I noticed there's a lot of chaos going on, but I thought that's the way it should be, because、mm-hmm. in order to question, you have to have some kind of a different source of information, and then you compare and you draw your own conclusion. If you only know one version of so-called truth, you just accept it. So why I、uh, I, I start to learn about it after I come back. Came out of China because when I、uh, came out of China, I was able to have、uh, different sources,、mm. and a lot of the sources were from Hong Kong, Taiwan, and and then back.、Um, I think in the nineties there was a brief time period. A lot of people started to speak up in China. So there was a brief period of time that was some kind of、uh, loosened, and people can talk. And then I said, "Oh my God." Everything I was told was a lie, and I could not even question the obvious、uh, problem. I could not question. But here it's like、uh, they did an even better job. They,、yeah. um, the left. I mean, they cannot control everything, but they controlled and、uh, indoctrinated kids so well that the kids they just don't want to even have an extra click to see what other side was saying. Why they disagree with us, and、yeah. uh, and now it's come to the point they are fact proof. You can tell them whatever fact doesn't matter that they don't want to hear it. They just want to believe what they believe. So I have to say, the indoctrination in America is much much more potent, much much more sophisticated. Yeah, because the truth is there and it's、yeah. available. They don't want to go there. Well, I I had one person. This was around COVID, but it wasn't related to COVID necessarily. But he was, you know, he was、uh, very progressive, and he told me in a private conversation. He said, "I want to explore some more right leaning news, but I find right leaning sources too triggering." And I I've thought about that ever since because I'm like, I read dark history, like I. I hate war, but I want to read about it because, like,、yeah. if, if I'm ever put in one of these situations, I want to make the right choice. It might not be the choice that keeps me alive, but I want to. Whenever I die, I want to be able to die with knowing that I did the right thing. And I can't imagine approaching life where I'm against exposing myself to information that. Doesn't conform to the reality that I've already accepted. I think it's so bizarre. But they were able to convince. I think by now, I think it's like a eighty, even ninety percent of the young people、yeah. to believe that the other side is so evil. The only thing you need to do is fight against them, or possible eradicate them. And there's no need to understand why they're that way. So.、Yeah. Yeah, it's I mean, dangerous. It's absolutely so much more dangerous than in China. In China, there is a and 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 there is a a cure. Like what cured me, you open up the information and you let truth be accessible, and people say, "Wow, that's what happened."、Yeah. Uh, but here, you know, but I have to say, in the Mao's China, that's what happened. They control everything, and the、uh, especially during the Cultural Revolution, all the books are banned, and so there are some old books that before the, and that you you could read、uh, the classics of uh, uh, Western literature, all all those things are banned. So you just、mm. absolutely have no information.、Yeah. But in today's uh, uh, China, they control the information in a different way, and the, today's China, the young people kind of like here, they are fact. Proof. Yeah, you can say, you know, America is not what you are taught. America, there is a freedom. They don't care. They just、yeah. say that America, they they the freedom causes chaos. Here we have water, so freedom is bad. 
Yeah. One of the, and I don't know how to address this or how to approach this, but it seems like one of the big problems is we have people who are looking favorable towards socialism and communism are looking favorable to something that they're not living in. So like when you were living in communist China, you were experiencing how horrible it is. But the people who are promoting socialism and communism are really so like when they compare it to capitalism, they're comparing their fantasy to capitalism. Yeah. They're not mm -hmm. actually comparing what socialism and communism are. They're comparing what they've created in their heads or somebody else has created uh, a, an image of what it could be. And that's what they're comparing to capitalism. And I don't really know how to address that, how to, uh, how to tackle that argument. Cause it's like, how do you, how do you, convince somebody that their fantasy is wrong i i, I don't know I, i'm struggling with that and of course i have uh i have something better than what you have i can say i lived through it yeah. it is not like what you think but they still argue with me you know they still say like you know the popular saying they did not do it right yeah it wasn't true they did not do communists yeah. right yeah. this time we'll do it right yeah. Um, but also, I, I have to say that uh, I'm so, so, so disappointed with so many Americans. And so many Americans, they enjoy the lockdown. They absolutely think that's the right way. They don't mind being uh, uh, locked up in their own rooms, uh, in their homes. Don't you think I see so many of them? Yeah. And uh, once they, they, they said, okay, you can go out, and a lot of them said they don't want to go out. And we, I still see, I still see today that people uh, walking outside with masks by themselves. Or driving in I a think car, yeah. I, I think, think it's There's bizarre. some people just, I, I don't know, hopeless. Yeah, I don't know. I, there's a, I have hope for humanity. I really truly believe that people are smart and can figure things out and we don't need the government. But then there's people like that that just kind of, prove the opposite that it's like oh they just do whatever they're told and there's no there's no thinking around it there's still people that think like the vaccines should have been mandated and it's yeah like, i know that, that, there's no but, uh, reason to believe that that was a huge in, uh infringement on human rights but here is the thing whatever revolution whatever good or bad it's all done by a small group of people yeah it is the small group of people that launched the American Revolution, and uh, and and then won, and had the independence, and built uh, this country. Now we are, you know, we're about to lose. Mm -hmm. And in China, even the uh, uh, Chinese Communist Party, it was done by a group of committed intellectuals. And the people say it's a peasant revolution. No, it's all led by intellectuals, committed small group. So if we can do. What the founding father did, if a uh, 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 small enough but committed people that we want to save this country, we can be successful because you can't depend on everyone. There are just so many people, they just refuse to wake up. No. And so, you know, no. can't let them um, affect us uh, no. because there are just so many people, they just accept whatever on, uh, come their way. Well, she, I, I think everyone should read your book, Mao's America. It was a fantastic book. It's so, I don't think people realize how uncommon it is for stories like yours to get out of that system. Uh, like most of, most of the people who live through that, who exist in that system, their stories never get out to the rest of the world. And I think your story is so important for that reason. So I definitely think people should read that. I would love to hear of any books uh, other than yours that you've read that have really influenced you since leaving China or maybe while you were in China, but I would imagine there are probably books you've read after. I'd love to know any other thing that influenced you. Yeah, there's a lot of books and actually there's a lot of uh, uh, Western uh, scholars wrote about the history of the CCP. Most of them are a little too uh, scholarly. I think a lot of people won't probably 
uh, only serious reader would read yeah. about them. Um, but I do have uh, a few that, uh, you know, I, I think that is a kind of a popular reader and it will give you a, a glimpse of uh, uh, what it is like to live uh, under communism. One is uh, titled Single Tear. Peer, peer, and yeah. I, I maybe there is a maybe a subtitle, and that book is so 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 extraordinary. It is the story of uh, uh, a man who was uh, in, in in around the 1950, and when the communism uh, communists in China already succeeded, he was uh, in doing his PhD in America for American literature, and he wanted to go back to help the communists to build a brand new China. And uh, so, because he also bought into this lie that communism will make China better. So mm -hmm. he did not finish his dissertation, went back to China, and then that's his story, what happened to him. Mm -hmm. And that is extraordinary, mm -hmm. what happened to him. Yeah. And uh, and soon, he because he's an independent thinker, which is not tolerated in China, and so I, I uh, and he wrote in he uh, in English. It's not a translation because yeah. he had a PhD, or he probably did not have his degree. But it's he he had um, studied uh, in the PhD program. Hmm. So single tier, and there is another one I highly recommend, and it's called a uh, blood letter, blood letter, and I can't remember the subtitle. Uh, it's a story about. Uh, her name is Lin Zhao, N L I N Z H O U. He is, she was a Christian, and she was uh, a baptized Christian in a missionary school before the culture uh, before the Chinese communists uh, succeeded, and then he converted. He denounced his uh, uh, her uh, um, uh, Christianity and become a committed communist, and then. During the process, he realized that communism is evil, and then he started to be a speak uh, speak up against communism. And he was uh, she was imprisoned and executed at the age of uh, thirty five, something like that. And because she was a writer, she was a journalist. She wrote a lot of works uh, exposing communism. She was the only person, only person during the Cultural Revolution, was able to um, denounce communism from the biblical perspective. Hmm. And uh, an extraordinary, extraordinary story. And uh, I, I'm trying to promote that book to let people know. You know, uh, uh, what's the guy's name? Uh, Bonhoeffer in Germany, hmm. right? She is Chinese Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer, I think I said it right. Hmm, I'm not familiar. It, it, it's a it's a it's a priest that uh, it's a pastor that uh, um, against Hitler yeah. and was eventually imprisoned and executed. Um, and so there's a biography about him and uh, I think movie about him or what. And Lin Zhao is Chinese Bonhoeffer, hmm. and extraordinary. So uh, there are more, but these two books. I think it would be really, really interesting for people to understand what it is like, yeah. what it is really like to live under communism. And people have no idea. And I don't know what else I can say. I think there's two choices. You listen, you learn history, you listen to people, and you learn from history, and you prevent the same thing repeat. And then the others just, I'll find out myself. I don't believe you. Okay, so when you find out by yourself, it is too late. Yeah, just like my parents, they joined the revolution. By the time they found out, too late. Yeah, stuck there. Well, she, it's been amazing talking to you. Before we wrap up, I want to hand it over to you to tell listeners where they can reach you, where they can find your book, and then anything else that you'd like to share today. Yeah, my book can be found uh, anywhere. Uh, major. Uh, booksellers, uh, the books are sold. You know, uh, Amazon probably the easiest. It's uh, the title is Mouse America, a survivor's warning, and it's really about the parallels. 
So it's not a history book. It's a lot of history there, but its main uh, focus is to uh, give people lay the uh, parallels out and let people know history is actually repeating in real time. And uh, so I am very active on X, formerly known as Twitter. I tweet every day and I tweet a lot of history lessons because I believe only when Americans know real history, real history of communism, the real history of Chinese uh, cultural revolution with their wake up. And so follow me on Twitter or X. And um, I don't use Facebook. It's it's not doing much anything. <laughs> yeah, I don't think anyone uses that anymore. Like it, it's used, but it's it's been a dying platform yeah, it's not, for a while. But I, and, and, and uh, again, I, I really appreciate people like you to help me to get the message out. Yeah. Well, she, thank you. It has been, I'm so grateful for your time today and it was a pleasure talking to you and, and learning more and diving in after reading your book. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for two hours of long uh, conversation and, uh, and, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Definitely.